You're listening to Cannonball Mindset, a podcast dedicated to helping people achieve the most out of their personal and professional lives. The Cannonball Mindset challenges you to step out of your comfort zone and lean into the possibility of having a life of abundance. Disruptors, innovators, and groundbreakers are all welcome. Let's get into the show. I'm sitting here with Charlie Ingle, Facebook Live, a uh, great friend of mine, um, only one of only a few men to ever run across Africa. I'm saying I don't even know if it's like if you're the only. I know you did it with a partner, ran across Africa. Best selling book, uh, Running Man, which is phenomenal, amazing, amazing book. Now you're now you're like have this uh, plan to track the summit, the highest summits on every continent from lowest to highest. So 5.8, we're going to talk about. And then you just talked about before we got on that you were you were training for something you just didn't know well, but didn't didn't know what but thanks for coming on charlie how are you oh man i'm glad to be here dude you you get me fired up every time we talk so and you said you hope we're live i all i know is i'm i'm live <laughs> I'm <laughs> i don't live. know if we're live i'm, I'm definitely <laughs> live uh yeah I, you know i think what's amazing is uh the amount of um just think about technology how this whole pandemic and this cold quarantine would have been different 10, 15 years ago than it is today. Like, how are you totally. handling? How are you handling the pandemic? Yeah, man. Um, psychologically, I'm handling it pretty well. I mean, there's a there's a strange thing that happens. I think to uh, a lot of us when we have shared suffering. You and I've talked about this before. You know, the greatest bonding experiences in the world are when you're sharing a really hard experience with other people. Usually for me, that means I'm trying to run across a continent or I'm doing a race or I'm, you know, something like that. And in this case, you know, this is a very unusual situation, hopefully once in a lifetime for all of us. Uh, But we are suffering together. And I think that um, I'll, I'll sum it up this way, because I think this is really interesting. A few weeks ago, when things, or let's say a month ago, when things really like went on lockdown. I live in North Carolina. And when that happened, um, I went out like two days later on on a Friday to my local trails. I am usually by myself. Maybe I see three or four people. That day, I counted over 300 people on the trail. And this is also at a time when we didn't, so, like, we got social distancing, but I wasn't wearing a mask. I wasn't, which I do now, all those things. The, the point is there was this almost like collective sigh of relief in a weird way. And, and people needed to get outside and burn off some energy yeah. and to, like, do something. And it felt, I felt really hopeful at that point. Flash forward to now, three weeks later, there's still people out there, but kind of like New Year's resolutions. Um, a lot of people have already faded back into their old habits and they're finding it really hard, I think, to, uh, to, to find a rhythm when there's an unknown ending to this. Like, we don't know if it's going to like, we know it's not going to end in a week, but like, we don't know if we're going to get back to, to regular life a week or a month or a year from now. So personally, my philosophy is keep training. Like if, if the world opens back up a couple of weeks from now, I've got a couple of adventures planned that I'm just going to go do. Like I'm literally going to get in a car the next day, drive to the mountains of North Carolina and do this almost 600 mile run that I've been talking about doing for years on did the Blue say, Ridge. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Did, you say, <laughs> did you say you're going to drive 600 miles or you're going to do a 600 mile run? No, so I'm doing a 600 mile run. So I'll drive to the mountains and, and do this run that I've been, you know, kind of threatening to do for years. And I, for me, that's what I need. I need to have that thing sitting there that I know that as soon as I feel comfortable doing it and I feel safe and uh, safe enough anyway, that I can get that's my short term goal that I've got something I can go do. It's almost like, okay you know, we're getting back to some sort of normalcy. But in the long term, I think, you know, we all understand there's going to be ridiculous amounts of PTSD, especially in the, you know, the people on the front lines, the healthcare workers. And we all know 
at least one and probably more than one. You know, yeah. all of us have friends who are doctors and who are nurses and PAs who are facing this this stuff every single day right now. And like, yeah. it, man, it's, there's going to be a lot of work to do and we need to be prepared. Yeah, I think I don't think I don't think that we, we and, and you know, I want to talk about, you know, how you I want to talk about your journey. We talked about it on the first podcast. You know, you're the first ever repeat guest on the Cannibal Mindset podcast. Like there's yeah. nobody that's come on. So 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 it's either it's either like check that box. Yeah, like you get to check that box, or the other ones were just like, I'm never talking to that guy again. So either you're like <laughs> crazy or, <laughs> or special. I'm being rewarded or I'm being punished. Yeah, I don't know which. Right. So I think I think the idea is though, if you think about I was listening to an interview with Bill Gates, and Bill Gates said, you know, we're never going back to normal. The normal has now changed, that it shifted, and that you know, people are still going to have some trauma about getting close to each other, going into stadiums, going into, and, you know, how long that lasts, you know, no, who, who knows, right? Who knows if it for, forever changes us. But how do you find right now, you know, obviously, you, you know, to talk about your past, you, you're the only person to ever run across Africa. You're, you know, you've done every crazy, running across a continent is crazy. Um, do you find that, is it harder for you right now to stay still or to run across Africa? <laughs> Man, way harder to stay still, you know, and as you know, part of my story is I spent some time in federal prison too. And strangely, like I'm probably uniquely qualified to survive what we're going through right now, emotionally and mentally anyway, because um, I know what it's like to sort of be quarantined and sequestered and, uh, you know, through years of sobriety and before that years of sort of killing myself through addiction, uh, I learned that all the best lessons come from the hardest things that we face. And I, I have said for so many years, I mean, what I talk about is resilience and is this idea that what happens to us isn't nearly as important as what we do about it. Yeah. And like quite literally, mo most of us go through life. I mean, it's just a fact. We go through life with challenges and we're on this little roller coaster. But most of it's pretty manageable when you when you really sit down and look at it right now. It's not manageable. Everything is out of our individual controls like we can't yeah. we can't make other things happen. We can only control our effort. And as I like to say, run the miles that are right in front of you. Don't worry about tomorrow's miles or the miles you're going to run next week, metaphorically speaking, because you have no idea what that's going to look like. Yeah. <laughs> you can't control it. And so focus on what's in front of you. And I'll, I'll say this, this final thing on this point. And I think it's really important if people will Try to and look. I have huge financial insecurity. I have like I have a, a wife who has immune issue, immunity issues. So I'm very, I'm terrified she's going to get sick and something's going to happen. And but who we are is not really revealed until things fall apart. Oh yeah. And and we're all getting a chance all at the same time to find out what we're made of. Oh my gosh, I love that. I was telling this story on a on a talk I gave yesterday. Where I, I'm doing this uh, 75 hard Andy Fasilla 75 hard challenge, and it was planned a couple months ago to start, you know, 30 days ago. So uh, planned to start March 1st, and um, and I was so on March 1st is when everything started to happen, and I started this challenge. And I was with a friend, and he said, uh, he said, you know, I don't think the 75 hard was was meant to be done during a pandemic. Now he was doing it; he knows me really <laughs> well, so he was doing me to kind of test me. He said, so I don't think yeah. the 75 hardest, but, but my response is like, we were, we were created for this. You were created for adversity. And I love the point you just made. Nobody's going to remember who you were, what you did before pandemic, before COVID. Like you get to completely reinvent yourself and you're going to see the best leaders are going to rise the most. Like that's where you really show your true character. It doesn't like, Nobody remembers what George Bush did before 9-11. If, if Donald Trump is not a political thing, if he led us through this, you know, nobody's going to remember what he did before. There's no talk of Russia or Ukraine anymore. That's all forgotten. All they care about is the crisis that you're in now. And you get, every time you get a new chance to redeem yourself or, or to reinvent yourself. Would you agree with that? 
I totally agree. And I mean, I, I think hopefully the mentality too, that people are, are taking is this, I mean, I love my running metaphors, right? But this is, <laughs> this is a marathon if there ever was one. Right. And so like when I described a few weeks ago, people were out and like and in a weird way, they were happy. Like all of a sudden they've got a Friday off that they didn't count on because yeah. we didn't understand what was really happening. And now what's happening is we're we're at mile, you know, I don't know what hmm. I would hope we're at mile 18. Let's just yeah. say we're at 18 and like people are hitting the wall because they've run out of that initial burst of determination and energy. And uh, this is the time we will remember. I'm, to your point, nobody is going to remember, nobody can even remember what it was like three weeks ago, because that seems like, it seems like a lifetime ago. Yeah, exactly. and, and now yeah. we're finally really facing the moment where you get up in the morning and it's like, holy crap, like what? What am I going to do? How am I going to do this? How am I going to, you know, millions and millions of people are, how am I going to pay the rent? How am I going to feed my family? How am I going to do all these things? And that's, and that's real. And I will say we have to come up with, you know, not, not, and I'm not talking politics, but I just mean human nature. We, we are not meant to be isolated, not as individuals or as a country the world has progressed too far and we have to find ways to, uh, to, to come together, which is, I mean, that's all kind of, uh, yeah. it feels like nonsense actually, but you know, we have to find ways to, uh, support each other and fight this thing together. And whatever your gift is, I, you've heard me say this a million times to keep it, you have to give it away to keep it. You have to give it away. So if your gift is, sewing or if, if you got a ton of money or you got you know whatever like now's not the time to be stingy or greedy right. share with the people who need it like like you know because if we don't get things back heading the right direction you know you can have millions in the bank and it's going to end up being worthless just like you know just like accounts that are empty yeah yeah i know I'm, listen i i'm i'm right with you i, I was listening to this great podcast couple of weeks ago and basically the whole gist of this conversation which hits uh, hit on it so uh, like we our leadership of this country and i'm not talking this is not a political statement this is I'm t this is not about a president or congress it's about leadership in government as a whole really messed this up and i'm not talking about when they acted didn't act i'm none of that but they could have framed this as this was that you know if you think about like our grandparents and the greatest generation the things they went through right and things that people talk about this was our op this is our opportunity this is our opportunity yeah. to do something that will be remembered for eternity. Like they look how they banded together. Look how they supported one another. Look how that. But the problem is it's so divisive now. Like if, if we could only just like put aside any any differences of what used to be and and share common ground and what we do now. Oh, my gosh, it would be they would write they would write books and they would talk about us as the new greatest generation i think we we yeah. i don't think we've as a as a nation i think there's a lot of pockets of it but i see more business leaders doing it now than our government and i think that's a that's i think that's great but i think it's a shame that our government hasn't hasn't framed this the right way would you agree i totally agree and i mean look leadership leadership is local as they always say politics is local and I am happy to say that here locally in North Carolina, we have a governor that's done a good job of messaging and keeping politics out of it for the most part. Um, our mayor here in Durham, North Carolina, got on top of this very early on and uh, really great, gave guidelines. And to me, those those reassurances without pointing fingers of blame and with all without all of that just being reassured i don't i it sounds funny to say but as the old saying goes fake it till you make it you know even if they probably don't know that much more than i do but i want i want to i don't want to be told don't worry about it but i do want to be reassured that whatever happens we will find a way to get past it. I mean, and, and I think that that is the kind of thing that that's what leaders do is they find a way to send messages to their people, their employees. I was on a conference the last two days 
with about 300 CMOs and CEOs. And I'm talking about companies like, you know, Google and Verizon and T-Mobile and like some of the biggest Fortune 500 companies in the world. And I was, I was just an observer in this particular case. I wasn't on stage, so to speak. Yeah. But, um, you know, but I got a chance to listen to some amazing leaders speak about their philosophy and how they're communicating with their employees. And look, some of them were hard. You know, they had to make decisions if they got a thousand employees. Do I do I lay off 750 people or do I cut um, salaries by 50 percent for all thousand? I mean, those are individual decisions that have to be made by companies. And I'm not in a position to uh, to even you know say whether they make the right or wrong decisions. But it takes leadership and nerve to take that kind of approach and to do that with yeah. people. Oh no, yeah, no question. I think you know part of it is just we have to we have to understand that this. I, I love the people that have said you know I am a I'm a COVID expert or I'm a I'm a you know I'm going to tell you how to make your company successful through this. And the reality is is nobody's ever experienced this. There is no there's, there's health experts right. But nobody, nobody knows exactly what the right move is and the wrong move. There's no, we're all figuring this out as we go. If we can somehow yeah. leave our judgment to the side for a little bit and just, and just unite, I think it would be better off. So, all right, switching topics real quick because, um, you know, you are you are the guy who who has done every ultra crazy physical feat known to man. Like I, I'm like, what's crazy is having spent a lot of time with you. I remember we were in California. We were we were. Um, we had shared an Airbnb and you were having this conversation about, I just got to find things that's never been done. I'm going to do things that's not like I'm going to, and you, that's where you started talking to me and you did a great presentation at that conference about this five point, this 5.8, right? This, yeah. what, what is it? I know you've already started it. It's insane, by the way. It's absolutely insane. If you want to know more, you can look at Charlie's website, charlieangle.com. But, but tell me about this 5.8 because it's, it's, this is nuts. Yeah, no, thanks for asking about it. By the way, one rule in the world is that if you choose to sit outside, someone will start a leaf blower. And so I don't know if you can hear it, but... <laughs> you can't, yeah. But <laughs> Good, hopefully you won't. But so 5.8, I mean, look, I call it 5.8, the 5.8 at Global Adventure Series. And for this series, I'm going from the lowest elevation on all seven continents to the highest elevation on each continent. And... The idea is, I call it 5.8 because um, we are, in fact, all within this 5.8 mile little sliver of space from the Dead Sea, which is the lowest elevation on the planet, to the top of Mount Everest, which is the highest elevation. And the point being, and I've been saying it for years, so it's ironic where we are in the world right now, like, we are in this together, like, whether we want to be or not, you know, you can't stop the fact that we are a global community. And so I started uh, in Africa last year with 5.8 Africa. And for that one, I went from Lake Assal, which is in Djibouti on East Africa, on the coast of East Africa, this amazing little lake there. And I crossed Ethiopia for 10 days on foot and on bike. And I crossed Kenya into Tanzania and all the way to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. And it, it ended up being about 2,500 miles. And um, it was a crazy, difficult experience, both physically, you know, and emotionally, because a lot of things happened there that along the way that um, tested my resolve. And not just physically, but... Um, just with contact with people and with all the things I had to deal with, it was a, it was one of the hardest undertakings I've ever had. I'm actually right now, it's another weird, um, I don't know if you call it a, it's not a plus, but I try to look at the positive side of COVID-19. I finally have time to actually edit the film that I created while I was in Africa. And so along with an actual professional editor, I've been able to spend dozens of hours these last few weeks cutting footage. And pretty soon, and I'll, I'll share it with you that so you can share it with your followers, 
uh, very soon I'll show you a little excerpt from that crazy adventure. Oh, that's awesome. So 2,500 miles. How long did it take you? It took me roughly 26 days. And so I biked and ran a combination of about 150 miles per day every single day for the first couple of weeks. And then I reached the base of Mount Kilimanjaro and I actually had 10 people waiting for me. So I had this, you know, you followed the adventure some. I like, I arrived in Djibouti and my, my bike, this bike that I'm supposed to be using, it's lost. And I don't finally get that bike back until like three weeks after I returned home. So I had to like scramble and find this cheap little $200 Chinese bike that I had to build myself to like go across the, the first portion of this journey. I had to, um, uh, we were two days late in starting the adventure and I've got all these people flying to Tanzania to meet me at Mount Kilimanjaro. And I mean, that date is on the calendar. There's no, there's no stopping that. And so there was a very stressful ticking clock going uh, most of the time. And I had to really uh, haul ass, frankly, to get there in time. And it, I'll tell you something else. So this adventure was a multitude of things for me. It's taken me, when I first had the idea that, you know, we all as human beings are on this never ending roller coaster of highs and lows, right? right? We have these brief highs. We have these lows that last too long, whether it's business or personal. And most of our lives are spent in that kind of middle ground though, for the most part, like, yeah. That's where we are most of the time. Um, but these super emotional, difficult times that are at the, the two extremes really exemplify the way we all live. And yeah. now, yeah. I mean, right in this moment, there's no better example than what we're going through now. This is a serious low. And I think it is the human condition. And if we can take the lessons from athletics, from running a marathon or doing a, a big doing an Ironman or a big adventure if you just keep moving forward in particular at the times when you know when you feel like you can't keep going and yeah. and focus on the steps that you know like I know if I'm running a hundred miles and I'm bonking I'm crashing I don't care if it's at 50 miles or 80 or whatever it is my mind is telling me to stop but if I really analyze it, I know that I'm probably dehydrated. I probably am calorie deficient. I'm, so if I will focus on the little things that I need to help me keep moving, it'll all work out. So I think that that's a good analogy for what we're all dealing with today is try not to worry too much about tomorrow. Yeah. Focus on the miles that are right in front of you. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, worrying about, you know, having, I, I understand the idea of having fear and anxiety. Hey, I, I own, I own my own company. You own your own company. Like my, your job yeah. is predicated. You've had to pivot really hard on speaking gigs. I've had, I've lost some speaking gigs over the last couple of weeks. And, um, but you know, the fear and anxiety just is not a good use of your imagination. Like it, it really like, because all you have, you have fear and anxiety about what may be, what could be not currently what is. And so I yeah. love the idea of just staying focused and just keep moving forward. Yeah, well, I, we call it, when I was early in sobriety, <clears throat> uh, my first sponsor would call it catastrophizing, right? Because to me, everything that happened, every challenge that I hit in that first year of sobriety seemed like it was an absolute catastrophe. <laughs> Whether it was my, you know, my marriage is over, my, I need to fold my business. I can't do this. Like, and he would just look at me and shake his head and be like, what, what are you talking about? He said, like, you only have to get through today, you know? And I, I would say to him, man, I feel like drinking. And he would look at me and he's going, he, he would make jokes. He was like in his seventies back then. And, you know, he would look at me and say, man, if I had your life, I'd feel like drinking too, you know? And <laughs> Most of it was self-inflicted. I was I was making myself and the people around me miserable because I was afraid. I was so fearful about all the things that I couldn't control. Yeah. And again, we we are in that place right now together. You know, we 
can't we can only control our small world we can only make our families feel safe you know i know your i know your wife and your kids and I actually they're know wa- for they're sure. Watching right now, they're, they're, they're oh, watching. Right now. They were like, they're like Charlie, Charlie, Charlie's coming on, and I was like, yeah, Charlie's coming on. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's a great example. I know, you know, I know you well enough to know that there are probably stressful moments, but there's a lot of love and there's a lot of trust, and everyone knows that when when it really comes down, everybody in your household knows that you guys are all in this together. Yeah. And, you know, you spend this much time together, you're going to disagree about who's doing what or not cleaning the kitchen right or whatever. I mean, those things are going to happen. That stuff is so freaking meaningless. And we, we tend to get jammed up on those little things. And now is the time to make a gratitude list every single day, mm-hmm. like every day, you know, make a gratitude list. It doesn't you can write it down. For me, that's the best way is you know i like to start my day with a gratitude list and some hopes of things i want to accomplish uh but that's another point that i want to make and i i'm you probably made the same point i feel the pressure to accomplish a lot right now because it feels like i have time and that's also a dangerous thing to do like it's okay to be unproductive like it, especially with what's going on, it is actually okay to take an afternoon and for me to go run and listen to a book instead of trying to, you know, sell myself and, and online speaking gigs every minute of every day. Like, it's just, that stuff's too hard. And, and in a way, we need to take advantage of this, this time in a sense to decompress a little bit. Because when things do come back online, and they will... We need to be, you know, emotionally and physically prepared for that. Love that. Yeah, I just said to somebody yesterday, and I, I wrote about this on um, an article the other day, that that the antivirus to fear and anxiety is gratitude and action. Like, be grateful and take action. That's it. Like, like because what happens is when I'm grateful, it's really, really hard to uh, be be anxious, right? So you, you can't you can't have these two emotions going at the same time. So I'm grateful. And when I take action, I feel pride, right? I feel proud about the actions I'm taking. And all of yeah. a sudden, those days just start to become wins. And you start to pick up wins and you, you create momentum that way. Would you agree? Totally agree. And you know, and it's, I mean, look, man, I, I know it's a weird way to go about it sometimes, but I, and I love this analogy. I've said it many times. I still go to AA meetings now right? I can't go now. I'm doing them all virtually. But my point is I still attend AA meetings even after 27 years clean and sober. It's not because I'm worried about drinking today, right? I mean, I feel solid. Like I have no desire to drink. I don't, you know, whatever. Like I'm not, I'm not going to a meeting to like white knuckle and stop myself from having a drink. I go because I actually get to interact with people who have one day or one week or one month sober and I get to see the struggle that they're having and I can offer my help, but I also get to have the gratitude that I'm not them. And I don't mean yeah. it in a, in a negative way, but again, yeah. with COVID-19, we, we also, if, if anybody, if I'm feeling sorry for myself, which I was for a little while yesterday, uh, a story popped up like, like a lightning bolt, you know, on my phone about what's going on in the slums in India right now. Mm. And, you know, in places where you want to talk about, you know, not having 10,000 ventilators, they don't have 10 ventilators. Like those are places where they, they, they make their money on a daily basis. They get paid daily. And if they don't get paid, they do not eat. And there are huge parts of the world right now that are, that's their reality right now. Yeah. And, and I need to be, you know, knocked over the head once in a while when I'm feeling sorry for myself about what others are doing. And, and the, the greatest lesson my very first sponsor in AA ever taught me was when you feel insecure and uncertain about what's going on, offer yourself up for service whatever that means like for aa it meant like come in early and make the coffee or set up the room or you know take action you said it a moment ago 
Yeah. Take action. Inaction makes me afraid. I'm scared when I'm when I'm not like taking positive action. Yeah, same and the best action I can help is to is uh, do is to help other people, whatever that means. I'm like you. You're a speaker too. I'm offering up. I'll get on the phone uh, with anybody. I'll talk to anybody's company for free at this point. Like I'll I'll do anything I need to do if I can be of service. Right. Because that service helps me get through this. Love that. That's that. I'm telling you. And then I think that's why we connect so well. I'm saying I, I can't tell you how many webinars and conferences I've done over the last three weeks, more than I've done in the last year, for sure. And it's all 99% of them have been for free. And it's all because I feel the need to contribute. And and you started the you started the talk off with it. And I think you know, I have a strong faith. And um, God says, you know, that you are a servant of what you are, what you have, right? So if you have money, then offer that. If you have time, offer that. If you have expertise, offer that. And so, you know, I think that if we each do that, what happens is, again, it gives you some normalcy. It gives you some meaning. And that, to me, helps get rid of that fear and anxiety. Like, okay, I feel, I feel useful. I feel purposeful at this time. And I think that's really important for people to understand. Like right now, if you're afraid and anxious, Figure out what you have to offer and then go offer it to somebody because that's your message, right, Charlie? Well, look, man, and it's easy. You know, you think about it. Most of us, you know, who are watching this and participating, you know, people have different amounts of money in the bank. They have different success in their life and whatever else. But the easiest thing to do is be generous when you have a lot. Can you be generous? when you're worried about what you have or when you have a little that's that to me is the real test of what yeah. what is what you're really made of and yeah. i'll give you an example you know we started off talking about africa you know i went through some really difficult times in my last journey across 2500 miles of africa a lot of countries <coughs> ethiopia being one they weren't all that happy to see me. <laughs> I had some challenges on my bike and I, d I had to learn to not take it personally. But every time I felt like I was at the end, like of my, you know, proverbial rope of like, I just can't deal with this anymore. I would come across somebody clearly impoverished, destitute. They had almost nothing to offer, yet they offered what they had, whether that was the shade of their building or a cold drink or you know just some companionship and conversation for a minute you know these were people that weren't asking me for anything they didn't know what i had to give or didn't have to get have to give but they were willing to just freely give of themselves in that moment and those lessons those lessons come back to me now more than ever because it's been my experience that the most impoverished places i've ever visited in the world are the places that have people that tend to offer the most, most love and kindness yeah it was just such a great like you hear about it but i think you i think I, I i think about it right now people are afraid and they're hoarding when the reality is is this is the time to be giving like get like i get it you gotta have enough for you but man, give what you give what you have, and whatever that may be. And I think for a lot of people right now, it's your time. And I think a lot of people underestimate the knowledge they have, right? There's a lot of people who, you know, I say all the time, everybody has a New York Times bestselling book in them. They're just afraid to write it. And I don't mean the proverbial <laughs> book, but everybody has something yeah. to offer. Your life story yeah. is a story of victory, right? And the yeah. idea is, you know, how do we share that with any with other people? How do we share our story with other people? Because you never know what you who you can help with that story. I remember one of our first conversations when we went for a run and I, I remember saying this to you and, and you know, I, I, you really related to it, I think. And that is this idea. People will say to me all the time, like, Hey, can you help me run a marathon? And like, I want it to be as easy as it can possibly be. Like I want to, I want to do this. So I want to train in a way that's going to make the race easy. Yeah. Like, so what they're saying is I want to be able, I'm willing to work hard in training so that the race can be as easy as, as it can be. 
And I always look at them, and I'm not saying you necessarily said yeah. that, but we were having this conversation, and I look at them, I'm like, why? Why would you want the race to be easy? Like, right. what do you gain from that? And, like, if I ask you right now, your last marathon that you ran, to describe, like, the most memorable moment in that race. Actually, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll just ask you. We got a minute. So yeah. if, you, if you think back about that race... Yeah. What was the most memorable moment for you in the race? And I don't know the answer to this. Yeah, the most. Do you recall? The most memorable moment in the race. Um, the most formative one. The 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 thing that shaped the experience for you. Oh. The story you came back and told your friends. Oh yeah yeah yeah. I, oh I know this because it was a month and a half ago in Napa. You know I was supposed to run Tokyo. And then they canceled, right. they canceled Tokyo yeah. Marathon with like two weeks, two weeks left, right? Or two weeks before they canceled Tokyo, and a lot of people were frustrated and upset. And I was like, my I was running, I was doing it with Dennis, and we like pivoted that day, and we signed up for the Napa Valley Marathon. And to be honest with you, I looked at the Napa Valley Marathon, and I was like, man, this is I've a, done it. This is a flat marathon, right? I'm thinking it's flat, right? Because it, it, it is it is negative. <laughs> It is negative overall, right? Well, then we get there, and the day before, we're riding the course, and it is nothing but hills. Like, no. like last five miles, <laughs> flat, but it is up and down, and it was it was brutal. It was brutal. So there's a stretch from mile six to mile, like, 12, I think, right? A six or seven-mile stretch that it is nothing, but, like, you're going up and down the hills through these vineyards. And the day before, I was like, "Man, um, this is this is crazy. This is going to be crazy, right?" Well, all of a sudden, like when I finished that, I wasn't even done the race yet. I was only at mile twelve or thirteen. I was like, "You would have thought I just like one. I still had, I still had another twelve miles to go, thirteen miles, fourteen miles to go." <laughs> I was like, "You would have thought I won like the, the, a gold medal." That was the that was the part for me yeah. that really stuck out to me. Like the the finish yeah. line was like you know remember right the finish line seems like the obvious answer to a lot of people. That's anticlimactic, man. The finish line is just that's just a thing. That's yeah. just a place. You know, yeah, you want to get there and get the medal around your neck, yeah. but the part of it that mattered. Uh, I'll tell you real briefly since it was Napa Valley, and I, I don't know if I knew you did that, but Napa Valley was my third marathon ever and i was this goes way back a long time ago and i was trying to qualify for boston <clears throat> and back then you had to run sub three hours to qualify for boston because i'm old and um the day started off sunny and warm at the napa valley marathon and it was like 70 degrees at the start mid 60s it was perfect i mean absolutely perfect weather by mile 13, the same mile 13 you're talking about, the temperature dropped 35 degrees. A cold front came through. I'm wearing a singlet and, you know, shorts like everybody else. And um, my, my, calf, my left calf started to tighten up. And by mile 20, I could look down and I, like, burst a blood vessel in my calf. So my entire calf was filled with blood, basically. I mean, it was, it had turned into one giant bruise. So it looked really impressive. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I finished, this was the first race my mother <laughs> had ever, marathon had ever come to. And she came to watch. I finished and I was so hypothermic that I spent like, I spent like two hours, you know, in one of those blankets trying to drink soup, you know, at the table. Right. And like I, it was one of the most beautiful. That first thirteen miles, I am sure somewhere in my mind was the most beautiful. Like whatever, oh. I couldn't tell you a thing about it because what I remember is the struggle. And I remember though that I didn't quit. I didn't give up. I kept moving. I got to the finish. Uh, I qualified for Boston. I like you know. And we remember struggle. We don't remember the things that were oh, easy. That, that is so true. And and listen, you no, know what's crazy is you know I've run I've run a lot of marathons and, and you know a couple ultras now. And the the idea that I have you know done New York and I've done Chicago and I've done uh, Berlin, Napa, like to me was one of the hardest ones. Even though the others are world majors, and 
I had my best time at Napa. So I took 20 minutes off my time or 15 minutes, something like that, off my time. That was the hardest race. You know, and you're right. I don't even I could not tell you one thing about the finish line. Nothing. I don't even yeah. remember it. Anticlimactic. People are always worried about getting done with things. And and like I, I would even make that the point now. And I keep bringing it back to what we're going through as a country and a world right now. We yes, we are all hopeful about getting to the finish of it. We are all like, you know, we want to get to the other side and see what it's going to look like. I think the world's going to look a lot different for for most of us, if not all of us. But the point is, nothing is stopping us from right now today having the best possible day that we can have. And I mean, the only, you know, you can make a choice to be happy and fulfilled and at peace, understanding that we are not in control, not just of coronavirus, but of anything. And anybody who thinks that they actually control every aspect or, or maybe even any aspect of their world is kidding themselves. And so for me, serenity, and I learned this in recovery, you know, serenity is the ability to be at peace in the midst of unresolved problems. And so right now, pretty much every aspect of my life <laughs> is unresolved, right. just like most people. And if you can't find serenity uh, during this time, then try to figure out what it's going to take. Exercise, meditate, talk about it. Find, you don't have to see a therapist, but you can find a friend and share your fears, mm -hmm. saying these things out loud. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. Yeah. Like completely deflates the power of that, that anxiety that's building up in us. And so yeah. reach out to people. Um, what you're doing right here, giving me a chance to run my mouth for a few minutes and to, and to hear that. you and, and hopefully share this with some other people. You know, if this is the time, this is, we have to be physically isolated, but not emotionally and, and pick up the phone, send emails. I, I love, I'll, I'll, I'll say this one final thing. I'm getting, I'm doing it now. I'm working on it already. I'm doing a, a letter to my mailing list and it's just simply a, it's a catch up because I, you know, I don't necessarily have time. I do have time. Probably. I don't want to call necessarily 200 people that I need to be in touch with, but why not just write a list? Cause they're wondering what's up with me. I'm wondering what's up with them. Yeah. And, and this is a way to, this is a time to communicate. Yeah, I love it. And listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna say something that I, that I hope doesn't get taken out of context and that isn't doesn't offend anybody. But we were doing the other night. So we have you know we've been quarantined here in Maryland basically for 35 days, 34 days. Um, yeah. And so it's at some level, and you know in those 34 days we've taken my wife and my kids, and we we've been in full lockdown. Right. We have taken 34 family walks in the 15 years of my kids, 20 years of my marriage, that's never happened before. Right. Um, we have had 34 breakfasts, 34 lunches, 34 dinners together. Right. Never happened before. Uh, we have gone to church together on, on computers, right? Like we're all new for us. We have, um, like the things we're doing my, and the other night, three nights ago, we were walking and my wife said, I'm just, I'm, I'm just ready for this to be over, right? And I really thought about it. And I was like, I don't know if I am. And, 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 I, mean, and I don't want to – I'm not, not minimizing. I know. I know what you mean. But, but I want people to get back to work. I want people to be healthy. I want I, – I, but, but I, I have so much gratitude for what's happening right now. That I get to spend this time with my kids. That I get to spend this time with my wife. Now, is it all roses and unicorns and sunshine? No, like you said, we're – in a, in a confined space together for 34 days, right? There's going to be arguments. But yesterday, I had the afternoon off where I normally would have filled it with calls. My daughters, Madison McKenzie, made, you know, 60 cupcakes. And we spent five hours delivering cupcakes to people. Like, literally, just putting them at the at, at, a, at, at somebody's door with a note on it. Do you right? need my address? Do you guys need my address? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll drive one and look at it. But that doesn't happen pre-COVID. Like, we're so busy going, 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 we don't stop. And I think that, yes, I want this to be over for all those reasons, but, but I want this to fundamentally change 
how we we appreciate and we spend time with each other and like we just go back and we just hit the hit the accelerator button again and we start living our own lives i think that we we've missed a big lesson here yeah no i mean you're you you really summed it up well there and i mean this is a i mean it's a gift it's a gift that most of us would you know to a certain degree want to give give back or return but you know the the point and i to your point we have no choice in kind of what's happening on a global scale right now we're in this the choice we have is what we do about it and you are making the most of it by spending time with your family and get i mean strangely we're we're getting to know the people that we live with better than we've ever known them before yeah. and I, I would also encourage anyone listening to this i've had to say i'm sorry a few times in my household <laughs> and I think the um, one of the more difficult things to do for me and for a lot of people is to apologize. Yeah, yeah because you know what? I'm 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 an ass sometimes. I mean, that's not a surprise to me or anybody that knows me. But it is still hard for me sometimes in this environment to not then just like go to my room or go you know find another place in the house to watch Netflix or to to whatever and like isolate somehow you know and that's just the wrong thing to do you know it doesn't now's not the time to worry about who's right in your household yeah. it's it's the time to you know pull together and say you know i'm sorry or i love you or you know let's you know let's play a board game or um no, i'm trouble. really sorry that i can't I'm sorry I gave away Guitar Hero a few years ago. I really wish I had that right now again. But yeah, I think it, again, it's just it, it, it's what you, it's the perspective you look to, you choose to look at it. So let me ask you a question. I, I know I got to be uh, conscious of your time, but I just want to ask you some some other questions. If somebody's listening to this, you're a guy who again we've talked about all your athletic feats, which are unmatched. Like uh, it's not even it's not even comparable. Like there's a lot of people who are trying to do these crazy ultras, these crazy marathons, but you are, you're the original, you're the OG, right? The, the original gangster. So, so the idea is how, do, if somebody's listening to this and they want to start, they want to start, they want to train for a marathon, they want to run a marathon, they want to get in shape. Yeah. Like what is your advice in how to, and then you gave me great advice because when I, when I, when you and I went for that run one day, I think I was in the midst of my third or fourth marathon. Maybe I'd run one ultra. And you gave me, in, in a, in a five-mile run, you gave me, like, books of wisdom, right? Um, what, what would you tell somebody? What would you say to somebody that's, that's on that? I, dude, I love it. That's a great question. I mean, because people are, you know, they're willing to get out and do stuff right now. They want to be outside. It's springtime. So, number one, and, and I mean this in all seriousness, take a mask, all right? I mean, I, I take a, I wear a buff, you know, those things that fit around like your neck and you can pull them up, yeah. whatever. So I actually wear a buff. So when I'm coming up to somebody, if I'm crossing or whatever, I don't care if you're walking or you're biking or whatever, you know, protect yourself and protect the other people by taking that. I know that's not your question, but yeah, that's yeah, just yeah. kind of number one right now. I like the fact that that's an action I can take to protect myself and anybody else out there. If I, cause I might have it. I mean, yeah. as we know, 25% of people right now are asymptomatic. You could have it and not know it. So the real question, though, about how to get started is, number one, do it today. Like now, above any other time in our lifetimes, if you can actually look at yourself in the mirror with a straight face and say, I'm not going to start until Monday, I, I don't know. I may just not be able to help you because I don't know what the hell you're waiting for. Like if you, if you don't have an hour to go out for a walk or a jog right now, then your life is out of control. Yeah. So th the thing I think I told you that I really encourage people, especially if you are at the, like you're either just beginning or you used to be a runner, but you've been out of it for a long time um, is do all your training based on time and not on distance. Forget about the distance. Like if you have an hour, go out your door for an hour. Start with walking, pick up the pace, walk a little faster. And then when you feel like it, start jogging some. Jog for 30 seconds, jog for five minutes, 
whatever and do this progression of walking and jogging if you have a loop then it's an hour you know find an hour that you can do if it's an out and back go out 30 minutes this isn't rocket surgery as we say um you know go out 30 minutes turn around and come back 30 minutes and don't do it every day like you can walk every day but if you're just beginning a running program the biggest mistake people make they're excited and it does feel good it wakes up all these muscles and endorphins and you sleep better and they're like well gosh i mean if i can do five miles i might as well do five miles every single day well the the body needs a little bit of a break if you're just starting again so alternate days you know walk today then do a walk jog tomorrow then walk the next day and walk jog the next day your goal eventually in that hour is to start with a little bit of walking then run the vast majority of it and finish with a little walking at the end yeah. but most importantly is to be gentle with yourself don't give yourself a hard time about what you you know you ate too much last night or whatever i mean try to be disciplined don't don't just lose it completely but yesterday is behind you can't go back and do anything you you can't go back and run yesterday if you didn't you can't uneat that chocolate cake or the pint of ice cream that you wish you hadn't had last night let that shit go <laughs> it just is not important right now yeah. you know but get outdoors take some deep breaths if anything as you're as a beginning runner slow down slow down there's no Nobody's chasing, unless somebody's chasing you, like, you know, <laughs> just slow down. You should right. finish the run. You should finish the workout actually feeling decent, energized, not completely spent. Oh, yeah. as, as you progress and maybe you have bigger goals, then you can find ways to push yourself and to, like, leave it all out there. Right now is the time to just get outside, get some fresh air get some exercise so you can sleep better. And that's the other two things that I want to say, no matter how much training you do, if you do not hydrate well and you do not sleep well, I've seen you and you don't sleep well, you're not going to get the benefits of the training. Your body's going to be under stress. And in particular right now, the last thing you need is more stress or, or, being physically run down it makes you more susceptible to all the stuff that's out there right now yeah. so hydrate sleep be gentle with yourself but get your ass out the door and do something i love that morgan just said preach because you know morgan she's like she's fitness yeah. like queen right so, yeah. so the idea is she's like you got to drink more water so like we share well now we don't share offices like her office is next door and now she's obviously working from home but she's like you're not drinking enough. I could, and that was the message you like, said. You're not, yeah. you're not drinking enough. You can go for a 12 mile run and not pee. You're not drinking enough. Drink more. Exactly. <laughs> like, I, I'm dialed yeah. in on the water now. Um, this is awesome. You know, listen, I, I really appreciate our friendship. Uh, my kids, obviously, you spent time with my kids and my wife, and they, they really appreciate. It. I'm going to ask you a couple more questions. I'm going to let you go. To everything you just said, you're the guy who just said the minute this is over you're going on a 600 mile run. And you didn't say that, like people hear that and they're like, oh, he's joking. No, you literally are gonna go run 600 miles, right? So I, yeah. I've learned that about you. Like you don't joke about things like that. Like, no, I'm just gonna go yeah. run 600 miles. That all started with one mile, right? There was, there was a time where you just had that one mile run. And this is when you were, um, obviously you you went, I'm not gonna mention the school you went, the university you went to because it's anti-University of Maryland. And nobody wants to talk about the Tar Heels because everybody hates the Tar Heels. <laughs> <laughs> but but at, at some point, you had to run a mile. And yeah. could, you, could you have ever thought the day you went on that first run that here you are all these years later and you could say something and mean it that you're going to go on a 600-mile run? No way. No way. And I'll tell you, the one the run I remember in my life, maybe better than any run I've ever had, was I was 29 years old. I just spent six days killing myself with drugs and alcohol and I made a commitment to running and I, I got up that next day and I put on my running shoes and I went out the door for like two miles and it was the hard, like I, I think I probably puked in the bushes and I like, it was awful. It was absolutely horrendous and I got through it, but the commitment I made was that I would do it every single day. 
every day. And for three straight years, I put on my running shoes and I went out the door and I did something. And you can't, you can't start a streak without day number one. So get busy. Love that. I love that. Uh, those of you who have not heard or read we got Charlie's book, uh, The Running Man, uh, phenomenal phenomenal book so here's what i'm gonna do charlie i don't i haven't talked to you about this but i'm i'm, I'm gonna volunteer you for something even though you probably yeah. don't, right because i already know you'll say yes so this is people watch have stayed on this one we're gonna put it on the replay obviously go on our podcast on itunes um but if you can if you go on and comment connect with charlie uh, we're going to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna do some sort of raffle where we give away an autographed copy of your book, right? So I'm sure you'll do that. Some cannonball moments. Uh, we got a lot of a lot of cool cannonball moments. Yetis. You, I gave. I think I gave you one of those, right, Charlie? If not, I'll send you. No, one. you didn't. Uh, <laughs> I will give you one. I know you're drinking coffee right now. Put a, put a cupcake in it. Send it. <laughs> I did not eat the cupcake. Just to let you know. <laughs> Just so everybody's aware, I am 75 hard, and I have not I don't my you. cupcakes. I did not eat it. Um, <laughs> but make sure you comment. Make sure you connect with Charlie. Charlie, where do people find you? I, you know, you have a great website, but where do people connect with you? And one of the things I love about you is you're so, um, so approachable. So um, people, like you, really I, buy into this. I appreciate that. You look. The best way to do it is just go to the website. It's just charlieingle.com. All my social media handles are there. Um, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter are all just my name. I'm very narcissistic that way, so it's just Charlie Engel. And, like, if you go into contact, <clears throat> the email and the phone number that's on the contact, that's me. It's me. So if somebody out there listening to this has a question about sobriety, has a question about running, um, has a family member who's struggling with something that you think I could, I'm no expert. I'm an expert in like one thing, and that's me, sort of. Um, I can't tell you <clears throat> how to do something, but I can tell you how I did it, and I'm always happy to share that with people. And if somebody wants a book, write to me, and I'm happy to autograph and send something out. And obviously, when you do the raffle, you just tell me where to send it, and I'll get it in the mail right away, dude. I appreciate that. I think, and, and Morgan just put your uh, website down in the comments, so make sure you just click on that. I think Great. one of the things again, I have, I have, um, I have a ton of gratitude from you know we've known each other for a while now since the very first podcast we've done, and uh, again, just how willing you are to share your expertise. I've taken you up on it. I've had people that were struggling with sobri sobriety, sobriety, um, yeah. people that had running questions. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, listen, you know what? You should talk to my buddy Charlie, and you've taken those calls. You helped my, you know, my brother when he ran his first ultra. Um, the, the JFK, the 50 yeah. where you helped him. So if you have questions, please reach out because not, you're not going to find a more authentic guy than, than, than Charlie Engel, that's for sure. So a lot of appreciation you, for you. Right I'm gonna back at you. I'm going to ask you the same question I asked you the first time. I'll see if the answer is the same, right? <clears throat> Uh-oh, I don't when, remember. When you, when you leave this earth 100 years from now, 50 years from now, 80 years from now, whenever you leave this earth, uh, what do you want your contribution to have been? Man, I have no idea what I said the first time, but I want that really contribution. Uh, I want it. I want it to be. Maybe it's just where my head is right now, and maybe it is going to be different than the first time. But I want it to be about service. You know, I, I want. I would love my uh, headstone, if you will, to say that I was available, that I was there for people, and that anybody that ever asked me for help that I was willing to give it to them with no questions asked and without qualifications, because that's the, that's the only thing I really have to offer more than anything else is just that, that I'm available for other people and that we are all in this together. Mm, I love it. I love it. Uh, Madison McKenzie have watched this whole episode. They said, hi, they can't wait for you to come back, uh, come back and spend some time. They're running now. So they're, they have, they have a 10 miler tomorrow. Yeah. They've done a half marathon. Nice. Um, they're going to do a 10 miler tomorrow. So, uh, it'll be a dream for them when you get here and then be able to go to for a run with you. Well, what we'll set up sometime and I encourage other people to do it. We'll do a, a short FaceTime call while we're all running. Oh yeah. That'd be awesome. You know what I mean? Just a quick, just a quick FaceTime. Like you could still have your running group, man. You just got to yeah, do it remote. Those are, it's funny you say that because I'm telling you, if, if you don't follow Charlie on Facebook and Instagram, do it right now because Charlie somehow has mastered the art 
of running and talking <laughs> at the same time. So he will literally do Q and A's with people <laughs> online as he's running. So one day I'm like, I'm gonna do that, right? I'm breathing so heavy. It's like a thoroughbred trying <gasps> like it doesn't it doesn't even though I have these orangutan arms and I got the perfect <sighs> like, like it doesn't uh it doesn't it's work practice. somehow yeah. I don't know how you do it. Like somehow Ah, uh, well you figured out I can talk if there's anything I can do it's talk. So you know uh, yeah, I can do anything running at the same time is uh Madison yeah. said hi, so she wants you to say hi and give her a shout out. Madison Hey Madison. Yeah, good go. to see you guys. I, I can't wait to see you again. We're now Baltimore. that you started running in particular, we're gonna run together soon. Yeah, I'm nothing, heading to Baltimore. It's nothing worse than seeing your your 15 year old daughters uh, smoke you, and they're like, "Dad, can yeah. you catch up, please?" <laughs> I'm like, "I'm get gonna, used to I'll, it. I'll be there in like an hour." So, um, yeah, Baltimore, Charlie, have a lot of gratitude for you. We'll be in touch. And uh, again, okay. if you don't follow Charlie Engel, make sure you check him out because he is the real deal. Thanks, brother. All right. Thanks to you and your team. See you guys later. Bye. All right. Hold your company accountable to its greatness. Consistent coaching calls and training tools equip your team to continually refocus on their why as they study and implement today's top sales strategies. The result? Transformation across your company culture and steady incremental increases in revenue until record-breaking numbers become the norm. To learn more, visit cannonballmindset.com. You've been listening to Cannonball Mindset. To ensure that you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast player. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.